Our donut is looking acceptable, but it could be improved with some compositing. So compositing is sometimes called post-processing, it's called like effects. It's essentially after you have finished rendering something, what, you, what is happening to that image? Whether you're adding glow or um, extra elements in the background, like layering things on top of each other. It's, it's something that is done frequently for movies, um, even like commercials. It, like Photoshop is a post-processing effect. So Blender has a built-in compositor that can help you do all these effects so you don't have to export it to something else in order to do it. So the way you access it is by going to the compositing tab at the top there. And the way you access high quality assets is by going to polygon.com high quality textures, high quality models, look, firewood, stone, amazing, and of course, HDRs. Sign up at polygon.com or by clicking the link in the description. And this will take you to a surprisingly um, blank looking screen. First of all, I don't want this dope sheet at the bottom. Don't know why that's included in the compositor. I'm just gonna drag it down. And then I'm gonna click on use nodes. And this means that now basically your compositor is gonna look for nodes to create your final image. But anyways, now that I've done this, you should see uh, you get two, two nodes, render layers and composite. And similarly to all the other nodes that we've already worked with, it works, whoops, left to right. You've got your render layer over here, which is what will be rendered. Then all this area here will be all the effects and things you wanna add. And then it will create your final output, your composite over here. Now, uh, we've got backdrop enabled, which means we should see our image in the background. Um, and we would see it if we had a viewer node. So if you control shift click on any node, it will add in and uh, it'll add in a viewer node and it will link it to the object that you've got selected. Now, if you don't see anything in the background, like I've got, that means you haven't done a full render yet. So you haven't hit F12. So we need to hit F12 in order to send that to the compositor so that we can actually see um, what we're doing. So it'll use the last image that is rendered. Um, but if, yeah, if you've just opened up Blender, like a, you know, reopened the file or something like that, then it won't have that stored. So you'll have to re-render it. So now I've done that, you can see that I've got it in the background there. Um, now using it like this, this is one way to work, um, but I find it also, it gets a little complicated and complex and you've got nodes on top of it. It's also hard to zoom in and out of that image in the background, um, you know, you have to sort of do this and it's okay, but I've actually preferred to uh, recently switch to this workflow, which is to split the view and then over here, change this to the image editor and then change from render result to viewer node and then it will do the exact same thing. So now my viewer node here, if I disconnected that, you can see it's hooked up. It's now gonna display what is rendered over here. Okay, cool. So um, we want to do, the very first thing we wanna to do to this is uh, adjust my background because it's very dark and spacey and mysteriously. I wanna make it pink. So um, I need to extract or basically, yeah, figure out like what, what is my, what are the actual objects in my scene versus the, uh, the, the background there. And currently the black image is baked into the image. It hasn't rendered it uh, transparently. So the way you do that is going to your render properties over here and then underneath film, you want to check transparent. Okay, now when you do that, you won't have seen anything change because this is a render property. I Meaning you have to re-render it in order to see the result. Okay, so, um, yeah, you can see now we've got a checkerboard pattern there, which means we're rendering on uh, transparent. And by the way, um, we will cover in the next part of this series how to improve your render time so that hopefully this, it will render faster for you. But for now, we're just doing composite. Okie dokie, that's good. Cool, so we've now got it on transparent, good stuff. So now we could change that color to be anything we want. And the way we do that is by adding in the color and then merging them together. So to add in a color, a single solid color, I'm gonna hit Shift A, same hotkeys everywhere else for add, and then go input RGB. Mm -hmm. So now uh, to combine, I mean, let's just, yeah, let's make it sort of a roughly pinkish color. And then I'm going to add, uh, to combine it with another one. The one we're looking for is underneath surprisingly color, very odd, alpha over. Okay, so I'm gonna drop this in, alpha over node, uh, take the output, put this into the bottom. Okay, so they're now combined to so two images being combined together. And you can see that we've just got a solid pink output. Um, and that is because it hasn't used the alpha information from our render yet. 
To use that, I'm gonna take my alpha and put that into the factor input there. Now you can see it's using the alpha, but it's doing it the wrong direction. So we need to flip these inputs around and now we've done it correctly. Mm -hmm. So now the color of my background is, you know, whatever I want it to be, but I'm actually gonna take the same hue. So using this little uh, eyedropper, I'm gonna take the same hue from my, uh, my donut, maybe about there. And then I could, uh, you know, increase the brightness a little bit or decrease it or make it a little bit more saturated. You know, just play with the visuals. You don't have to get it right first time. You can come back to it. It's a good thing about working with 3D and working uh, non-destructively is you can just set it, come back to it later once you've got more elements and things. So that's cool. So let's talk about the power of compositing. Let's do something that you couldn't do with, uh, it would be difficult in any other way, right? So we could have, as I mentioned, we could have baked the pink uh, color into the world information by setting it here and then changing it in the shader. If we did that though, the pink color would then be baked into the image. We couldn't change it. We couldn't add any effects or anything to the background if we wanted to. But now that we've done it like this, we've got an advantage. We could add in, for example, we've got light that's coming in the uh, you know top left down direction. It'd be nice if it wasn't a solid pink color, but had a kind of a gradient, right? So it was kind of lighter up here and kind of went down. Um, and you could do that a number of ways, but the way I'm gonna do it is with a, by first of all, adding in a white color, like a white circle up here, and then blurring that circle and then applying it over the top. So to add in a white circle, it's underneath matte. You've got a whole bunch of little matte options here for adding a box or you know things, and you can use it in really complicated ways. People that know what they're doing with compositing can do all sorts of crazy things with this uh, list here. The one we're looking for is e ellipse mask, which ellipse is, just circular, basically. <laughs> now, if I control shift left click on this, you can see that I'm now just looking at that uh, ellipse. So control shift click on anything else and you can just isolate that. So I'm now just looking at my, my little circle there. So um, you got a whole bunch of options here. You just play with it. You can kind of figure out how it works. The width is like how, you know, does it match the width of your height, etc. You can do some fun stuff here. Um, what I'm gonna do is just make this, you know, let's go 0 0.5, 0 0.5, so it's a complete circle. And then, whoops, okay, that's really fast mover. I'm gonna hold down shift so that I'm moving it just with small movements. And then I'll move this at the top here. Okay, that's pretty good. So it's at the top corner. And now I wanna blur that to make it become a gradient. So I'm going to add in a filter blur. Okay, drop this in here so that I'm still looking at it through my viewer node and then I'm gonna change my Gaussian to fast Gaussian, which, I mean, look, to be honest, I haven't tried out most of these. Fast Gaussian is the one that I've just always used and it's fast. Um, it does a pretty good job. And uh, you could set this to like pixel amount and that's all well and good, but I find relative is better so that it doesn't change depending on the size of your render. Because if you use this, if you were to like suddenly double the size of your render, this value would not change with it. So I don't like that. So I check relative so that it's relative to the size of the dimensions you've got. So whatever you set this to, it's always gonna be the same amount of blur roughly. So um, aspect correction, let's just say Y, either one. I, I never really know, it doesn't really matter. <laughs> but now you can see the effect that I'm doing. If I crank this to like higher and higher amounts, I'm getting a gradient effect, right? Or a, yeah, roughly, Gradient-esque effect, something like that. All right, that's pretty good. Um, so, you know, how big do you want your blur? Maybe I don't want it that big. <laughs> All right, now let's uh, combine this with my alpha over, with my th the rest of my image over here. So we used alpha over, and alpha over is good when you're combining things with a hard alpha. At least that's the way I sort of think of it. In this case, we want to add in just like a white effect. So taking, because this is a black and white image, I just wanna take the white values and apply it over the top of this. Um, and that's really easy to do. Now, if I did it after this, then it would be combined on top of the sprinkles and over our donut. So I don't want that. I wanna put it in between here and here. So I'll put this down here and then here, I'm going to use not an alpha over, but a mix node. So just like we covered in the shader, the mix node is very similar to just like adding in a new layer in Photoshop. You get this list of blend types here, and then you've got your opacity slider here, right? So if I now take my blur and I put this into my bottom input, and if I wanna take just the white values, what do I use? I use add, ha ha ha, look at that. So now with this now, 
being combined. So I've got my blur, my, yeah, my gradient effect combined with my pink. And it's now going into the, uh, the, the donut is now appearing over the top of it. And now I can change the add value. And this is now my opacity for that gradient effect. So you go really subtle or not so subtle. It's up to you. I think I went for something subtle. But yeah, you can do some fun stuff. You could make a gradient of like different colors if you wanted to. You could do some, uh, you should do some, some cool stuff. <clears throat> it's kind of the joy of compositing is like, you can kind of play around in real time without have to waiting, without have to, without having to wait. Ooh, all right, I'm trying to speak today, it's, a, it's an issue. Okay, so another thing we could do with our compositor is add in some glow, like some of these highlights here. Um, they seem hot enough that in if it was a real photo, you would kind of have like a bleed effect where like this area here would start to like bleed into this direction, right? Um, and it would do the same from here and here. So it kind of like wrap around everything when it's like really hot. Um, so there's a couple of ways you could do it in Blender. You could use a glare node, kind of easy, um, but I don't really like the glare node. I'll, I'll show you why. But um, the way I'm gonna show you is uh, we're going to blur parts of this and then apply the blur over the top and it should look like glare. So first of all, yeah, let's just add in, well, we've got a blur node. So I'm just gonna duplicate my blur node, Shift D. Okay, and then take my output of my donut because that's the one I'm gonna be applying the glare to. And then let's shift, control shift, left click on that. And you can see what we've got. Um, we've got something that's way too hot, way too blurry. So let's just dial this way, way, way back. Okay, something like this. Okay, now this is all right, but we've got a whole bunch of color information here that I don't want. I've got blue, I've got all this other stuff. I've even got shadows and there's no reason you would have glare in a shadowy area. We only want it to show in the areas where it's reflecting. So I want to find those reflective areas and only apply it to that. So how could I do it? Well, it'd be very difficult to do, but we're using 3D software, computer software, and it should know what that information is. We just need to extract it. So we can do that with passes, render passes. So you can uh, enable this for a render by going to your layer properties, view layer properties, um, and you've got passes right here. So Passes, render passes are a very common thing in 3D. For productions, you'll typically see crazy elaborate setups that's got all sorts of craziness and crypto mats and mats and all sorts. It'll have a whole bunch of stuff going on. Some people's post-processing steps are huge. They export all the passes, they bring it into Photoshop and they tweak each one. Um, I like to do it all in 3D as much as I can. But in this case, it's a perfect example of something I wanna do. I wanna extract my glare and I wanna do it over here. Um, the way I would do this is underneath your passes down here, you've got a whole bunch of passes for diffuse. That is sort of like the natural color of your material, like pink, blue, green, that kind of stuff. You've got glossy, that is reflective light. That's what we're gonna use. Transmission, that is through glass and things that are like semi transparent-ish. Volume, that's for like smoke and fog and things like that. And then you got an emission, shadow, blah, blah, blah. So the one we're looking for is underneath glossy. And you can see for most of these, you get three, direct, indirect, color. Direct is the actual direct light. Indirect is a bounced light. And then color is just the color of the gloss, which in this case should be completely white because it's not metal. So there's no color to the gloss information. Um, so we're not, we don't need indirect and we don't need color. We just need direct. So when I check that little box, you'll see something's happening on the left-hand side. We are getting an extra pass, a little extra input there. So if I control shift click on this a number of times, I should eventually be able to see just from that through my viewer node, which is all the way over there, the glossy direct pass, which is empty. <laughs> the reason for that is we have not rendered. So once you add, because we didn't add in this pass at the time we did the render, it hasn't been generated yet. So we need to do another render. I actually think Blender would do best if it actually let users know that that was the case. <laughs> One of those usability things, but it should probably, instead of it being blank, show, you know, needs to render or something like that. As a, uh, a Blender's made some huge changes recently to improve its usability, but there's always more room for improvement. And in my opinion, that's one of them. Anyways, look at that. We've now got a uh, pretty cool looking render. I mean, some people <laughs> I've seen like artists on ArtStation or whatnot 
you know, render a character or something, you get this kind of like glossy, sweaty looking face that's like purely black. And it looks so cool that you end up using it as your final render. Um, but anyways, we've got the information we want now. So now if I take that, that glossy direct pass and put that into my blur node, have a look now. We've got what could be used as glare if we combine it over the top of this original image. So we've already got an add node. So if I just shift D to duplicate that and drop this in here. So my alpha, my, my, my donut pass, all my donut information is going here. And then I take my blur and I put that in the bottom. Everything that goes in the bottom input, that is what is going to be added on top. So that's what is gonna use this and be controlled by this slider here basically. But yeah, you can see with the effect we've got, right? So I mentioned that it should be bleeding over, right? So if I turn that up, you can see it's bleeding over. Now it's pretty severe bleeding. <laughs> it's coming over, uh, it, it's a very big blur. So I'm gonna turn that back. Let's go, let's try two. Two might be even too low, I don't know. Hmm. Let's try one. All right, there we go. So that is a really small amount. Okay, now one thing you note is that sometimes it just, other parts, some parts look great and then other parts don't. And that can just be the fact that the lights that we've got for the rim light, for example, are way too hot. So that's fine. You can do things out of order. You don't have to, I don't actually like the fact having two rim lights. I, you don't have to do it in order, right? So I might now just go, you know what? These lights are too hot because it's now blowing out my glare. So I'm going to play with that. There's all sorts, I mean, like, you know, compositing nerds. We'll just call them that. <laughs> People that are like full-time compositors, they will do things like add a mask that just around this one area so that we remove the rim light. I don't want to get that advanced. I'll keep it fairly logical. Um, something other renderers do that I'm sort of jealous of is um, they do the uh, post effects, like glare, um, bloom, you know, all that stuff. It does it in the render. Um, like Corona does that, for example. I actually, re I really like that. I wish that Blender did that because you wouldn't have to mess around in the compositor and it would do glare and everything a lot better than the way uh, the, the way we're doing it now. Um, but it's okay, it's all right. So I've got less coming through with the rim light. It's all right. I might just have to make this bigger. Let's go like, th well, what was it? Like three, let's go 3% and then I'll turn this way down so that it's a, just a subtle amount. So. All right, so this is what it looks like before. This is what it looks like after. All right, so we still, eh, it's a little too hot on the sides there. It's a little bit too big, uh, but it's all right. Okay, so it's, it's a very subtle amount, which is honestly, it's probably the way to approach this. You don't wanna, you know, make it look too shiny. Like it's like, I don't know, you're looking at like a diamond donut or something, um, but, yeah, we, we've got something that looks looks okay. All right, so something else that we could do with our donut is um, we could do some like some some color grading, right? Because you can do color grading here, your color management. I mean, this is a whole other topic of like when to do color grading, what sort of color space you're working with, transforms, linear space, you know, scene referred. It's all very complicated. You could do it here with your you know use curves as I've mentioned before. Um, you can do it in the compositor. So that's the way I'm gonna do it here. I'm going to add in, um, because we've got high contrast, but I want it to be just a slightly smidge more contrasty, but not as much as high contrast. So we'll go, we'll keep it high contrast and I'm gonna add in a color balance node. And I'll drop this in at the end and let's connect this now to, my, by the way, the viewer is only gonna be just what's viewed over here. If you actually wanna save it into your final image, it has to go into the composite node as well. All right, so this now gives us three wheels. We've got a highlight wheel, we've got a mid-tone wheel, and we've got a dark tone wheel. Did I get, oh, did I do it in the wrong order? I did, okay. Wrong order. This is the mid, the dark tone wheel. This is for just like the really dark shadow areas will, will be that one. Um, this one is your mid-tones, okay? So I could you know, play with them. I mean, it looks terrible if you go all the way to one extreme, but you could play with the mid-tones there. Um, and then you've got your highlights over here. So you could change the colors for just the highlights. Um, now, the, the correction format, the, the, the one that you should be using is offset power slope. It just means that this middle one, for whatever reason, is inverted. 
Don't like it. Don't understand why that is. I'm sure there is a reason, but it is. Uh, but it will handle the color a lot better. It'll preserve the details. It'll do the transforms in the right manner. So I have heard. Somebody more experienced than me has told me that, so I'll trust them. Now, um, if I add in, if I make this basically... If I want it to be pink, I have to go into the green area. If I wanted it to be uh, blue, I would put my thing over here. So it's the opposite side. It's just, yeah, it's a little annoying. All right, so um, this is my midtones, and I'm trying to make this side look a little bit pink, pinkishy purpley. And I also want it to be a little bit more exaggerated, like a little darker in the midtones. So I'm going to increase this, which will darken it slightly. Very weird way of working. Um, something else I'll probably do. Because I can just see the, the lighting on this, this underside here. I'm not entirely happy with it. So I'm going back to my render here. And let's just move this over a little bit. Whoa. I feel very disorientated. Let's move this over. Underneath it a little bit better. Let's have a look now. All right. That's good. And I'll just increase the size of that just so that it wraps around this side of the donut a little bit better. And you know what? I'm going to give it a little bit of a pink hue. And maybe I'll just remove the color from here. So that's the thing. It's like, you know, do you do it in the compositor or do you do it in your actual scene? And everybody has a preference. Some people are used to certain workflows. I like to do it all in scene as best you can because compositing is kind of like it's fakery and fakery only, the illusion only stands up so well. After a while, it starts to break down a little bit. So, um, yeah, that's, I mean, look, I, I, I'm not going to make this a color grading tutorial. <laughs> that's its own thing. Um, this is just uh, keeping it fairly basic. Something else you could do with the compositor um, is you could add in, where is it? I'm always like nervous to show this because <laughs> it just gets so much hate. Lens distortion. Okay, if we drop this in here, you've got distort and you've got dispersion. Dispersion is your chromatic aberration, if you're familiar with that term. If I set this to a really high amount, you'll see what it's doing, okay? It's doing that cheap camera effect, like cheap lenses. And, you know, if, if you take a photo of the trees with your smartphone, for example, you probably see it, but you get kind of like a separation of the, um, the cyan, the red, the greens, depending on which side it's on. Um, but it's kind of, it's, it's doing that effect for you. And look, the, the thing is, it looks cool. Um, so people end up overusing it, <laughs> but it should be used at a tiny, tiny amount, like 0 0.005, um, so that you would just barely see it on your sprinkles. It doesn't really affect the middle of your screen. That's how chromatic aberration works. It's on the edge of the lens. Um, but it's a, it's a subtle effect and, you know, it might even not be appropriate for something like a stylized donut. Um, but anyways, the other thing it's got is distortion. Which if I, you know, let's set this to a little bit higher. Oh, that's ridiculous. Okay, 0 0.05 maybe. You can see it's got, it's like sort of bending the edges of the frame, which wouldn't look good until you check fit, fit, and then it will expand it to fill. And that is to emulate what all lenses have in the real world, barrel distortion. You will never get, if you took a photo of a building, um, you would see that it's not a perfectly straight wall. It would have a slight bow to it and you'll always get that. You'll get it more extreme with like, you know, fisheye lenses and things like that, but every lens will have it. There's no way around it unless you use like a pinhole camera. Um, so <laughs> distortion will do that. It's not really no, like necessary for something like a stylized donut, but I wanted to show it anyway. Just use it for a tiny, tiny amount. So I'm using it at 0 0.005 and I'll say fit. Okay. The other thing you can do is add in a tiny little bit of sharpening. Um, which is like a really easy way to just improve any image. So filter, filter, <laughs> I don't know. All right, I, I assume that this filter node, because it can do like lots of weird things, it was probably one of the first nodes the compositor came with and it just ended up being called filter. It's, it's, it's just sort of a mixed bag. I never really use any of the ones in here except for sharpen. It doesn't, ha it's not, look, I'm not going to be, <laughs> try and sell it. It's no way near as uh, detailed as like the unsharpened filter in Photoshop where you've got radius and threshold and everything. It's just got an amount, um, which is crazy. They should really, really add something to improve it. But it's just going to add some, a little bit of quick sharpening to something. You don't need much of it, right? So like that is too much. It just looks like, like it's like screaming out at you or something. Um, with great power comes great responsibility, all right? Don't go too hard on your uh, sharpen amount. 
Yes, it looks cool, but people should not know that you have used a sharpen filter. All right. So this is what it looks without it. And that is what it looks with it. Very, very little change, but it's just enough that it'll like put you above the riffraff who don't know about the sharpen filter. I don't know. All right, so this is what we've done in the compositor, working left to right. We started with our image. Then we combined it with a background and the background is made up of a single color, an ellipse mask that has been blurred and then combined over the top of the single color and combined with the donut. Then we blurred the highlights, which we got by extracting the glossy direct pass. Then we combine that over the top with a 0.1 amount of opacity, a small amount of glare. Then we did a slight color correction to just darken the midtones a little bit, which I did just by raising the value because the midtone works the opposite when you're using ASD, AS, C, C, D, L, and then lens distortion. Little bit of lens bow to it. In fact, that's even, is it too much? I don't know. And then uh, sharpen on top. And that's it. So that is how we do it. Uh, that's the compositor. And uh, as I mentioned, you know, people can do crazy things with the compositor. So this was just a basics, you know, getting you familiar with what you can do for, you know, as a single artist, just working on a project by yourself. You don't want to have to export to Photoshop and After Effects and everything. You just want to do it all in one software. Blender's got the features. The compositor is outdated. A lot of users do complain about it, but it's, you know, fine for basic stuff. I use it and um, it, it's, it's fine for basic stuff. So just quickly, because I have just remembered one final step that happens right after this, uh, right before this blur, is that it's currently putting blur on everything, all of the uh, the specular highlights. Whereas with a real lens and a real effect, you would only see it on the really hot areas. So we want to um, basically drop a threshold. So we're only seeing just these really bright areas and a few ways you could do that. But an easy way is with a, uh, a basically an S curve, what do you call it? Um, it's underneath RGB curves. So if I drop this in here, this is a really common node um, to do like just simple adjustments to, you know, brightness and contrast and things. Um, so I'll drop this in here and let's just quickly visualize this. If I drag this down, that is going to be uh, just like increasing the contrast essentially. So I'm now seeing less and less of the areas that I don't want. And I'm seeing, yeah, it's basically gotten rid of all these like little mid tones and things. And it's just left the, like the hard specular highlights to really, um, to really pop out and then I will uh, let's just increase the brightness of that as well so that we've got a little bit more coming up on the uh, on the donut so this is yeah it's the uh, it's the RGB curve it's the S curve if you don't know about it you should learn about it it's uh, this is the contrast end and then this is the highlight end and then this is the mid-tone end essentially so this is you usually the S it's it's called the S curve because it becomes an S it's very common contrast highlights um, or is it dark tones highlights anyways that's how I sort of imagine it. Anyway, now if we have a look at this, well, let's, I guess, have a look through the blur. With the add node, we should see that it'll appear in less areas, which means I should be able to increase the amount of it and it should look a little bit nicer. So let's try a point three. Yeah, that looks a little bit better. So this is with it turned off with absolutely nothing. So you can see it looks a little bit, just a little bit boring. And then you, when you've got it in there, with a 0 0.3, 0 0.3 might be a little bit too much. It does look a little odd at the end there. Maybe a 0.24, um, but yeah, just adds a little little pop, a little something there to uh, to show you how it works. So that's gonna do it for our compositing effects. Uh, go ahead and join me in the next part. We are gonna be learning render settings to improve your render before, that improve your render times before you do that final animation and render your 300 frames so we can get those render times down. Um, so go ahead, click here, and I will see you in that video.